Good morning. You're watching Market Cafe with me, Shreyanti Singh, and my co-anchor Snehi Shah. And over the next one hour, we'll take you through news and updates from within the country as well as across the globe. Get you through the roundup of brokerage notes and what they're saying, as well as the stocks that you should keep on your radar. But Snehi, to begin with, what does the handover look like in terms of uh, the U.S. markets? Well, absolutely, Shreyanti. So we were shut on Friday on account of Republic Day, but the world was working. So we do have some moves coming in globally, but rather flat when it comes to the U.S. markets. Wall Street did not do much on Friday. You had the Dow that was uh, up just one tenth of a percent. S and P 500 rather flat, like as flat as can be, but ended in the red nonetheless. Nasdaq. Nasdaq though was the loser among all three indices, down almost four tenths of a percent. But U.S. stock futures fell across the board last night as Wall Street looked towards several mega cap uh, tech earnings reports and the uh, Fed Reserve rates policy decision. Two major events to watch out for will be all the tech earnings that we will be seeing on Wall Street this week, as well as the FOMC rate meeting outcome. Now the three major averages all rose during the previous trading week following encouraging economic data. Economic growth in the fourth quarter was stronger than expected. Core inflation on a yearly basis was lower than what economists had polled, and this suggested a cool down in price increases. But however, the market's gains were more than muted compared to the prior week's rally after notable companies such as Intel and Tesla disappointed on their Q4 earnings front. Now this week marks the busiest week of the earnings season with 19% of the S&P 500 companies. Reporting their earnings this week, mega cap tech names like Microsoft, Apple, Meta, Amazon, and Alphabet, part of the core group of the big tech companies that have led this year's rally, will be posting their quarter four results all in the span of this week. Investors will also keep an eye on several Dow components reporting their quarterly earnings, including Boeing and Merck. Meanwhile, uh, the other key event is the Federal Open uh, Market Committee, that's the FOMC, will begin its two-day policy meeting on Tuesday. So, Shreyansi, Thursday is going to be such a busy day for us because we will be having our budget as well, and Thursday night is when we will be getting the FOMC decision as well. And investors are nearly certain that the central bank will keep rates steady. Traders in the Fed funds future markets assign an almost 97% probability that the Fed. Will Will not cut rates at the upcoming meeting, according to the CME group. However, the stance and the outlook will be the one key area to watch out for, and what uh, the Fed president also has to say. With that, let me shift focus to Europe. So this was the handover coming in from US. Not much happening. Shifting focus to Europe. Well, it's a green across my screen because all European indices ended last week as well as Friday in the green. You've got DAX that's up three tenths of a percent. FTSE up a whopping one and a half percent over there. CAC 40 up 2.2 percent, and Stock 600, which is the pan-European index, up 1.1 percent. And largely, all of this was held up by uh, LVMH, that's Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy's earnings. Uh, that stock was up 13% on Friday, and that also made the owner Bernard Arnault the richest man on earth. He overtook Elon Musk on the back of this stock uptick that uh, you know the street saw. So, well, Shreyansi, a positive handover coming in from Europe. Rather mixed when we see coming in from US. So, well, let's see how that pans out for us. Absolutely, and when you look at oil prices as well, we've seen a macro fillip come in. So, when you look at US crude oil on Friday, that closed out its best week in more than four months. And this is as positive economic news in the world's two largest economies raised hopes for more robust crude demand this year. So when you look at the WTI contract for March, that gained a little bit, uh, like uh, just about uh, eight tenths of a percent there about, and settled around that seventy-eight dollar a barrel mark. When you look at Brent crude as well, that settled around that eighty-three point five barrel, uh, five dollars a barrel, and that was up about one point three percent. So U.S. crude also posted its best week, up 6.2 percent since September one. While when you look at the global benchmark, that was last up 6.35 percent for the week. Now WTI as well as Brent have gained more than 8 percent respectively for the year. So that's an important move coming in in uh, as we wind up January as well. Now Houthi militants in Yemen have continued to target red, uh, shipping in the Red Sea despite U.S. airstrikes. So also something the market is keeping an eye on. And when you look at de- demand fundamentals as well, the potential for more robust demand comes as crude supply fell in the U.S. due to winter storms, and uh, crude inventories fell by 9.2 million barrels last week as production dropped by 1 million barrels per day, and this is according to data from the EIA. Now, elsewhere on the supply side. OPEC and its allies are not planning any changes to oil output cuts at the group's meeting Thursday, 
and this is according to several delegates and this is what they've told Bloomberg News. Now OPEC Plus is cutting 2.2 million barrels per day through at least the first quarter to support prices. So that's about oil and when you look at gold prices as well, gold prices held steady on Friday and this is as investors' attention shifted to the US Federal Reserve's policy mute meeting due next week for more insights into the interest rate outlook. Mind you, lower interest rates decrease the opportunity cost of holding the yellow metal. So let's see how that pans out for gold as well. Well, absolutely. And then let's just focus to all the important events that you have to watch out for. Like I mentioned, 19% of the S&P 500 declaring its results. So lots of volatility on Wall Street. And that flip over will also be reflected on our street as well. So, well, let's see what the cues are. First of Feb, big date for everybody. US Fed interest rate decision, the FOMC press conference that will be taking place. First of February, you've also got UK in focus because the Bank of England will also be declaring its interest rate decision. And well, the biggest event to watch February 1st will be the union budget but do take note that this is the interim union budget it's a vote on account budget so don't expect uh, too many large announcements but yes that will be one key day to watch out for then on th uh, January 30th, uh, it will be the last day to buy a whole host of stocks to be eligible for dividend and that is Siemens as well as Persistent Systems. And well on th uh, 31st Jan is the last day to buy Metro Brands as well as Poonawala Fincorp to be eligible for those dividends as well. Shifting focus to corporate action then, 31st January, you've got the Chumbal Fertilizer share buyback. That will be closing so that stock will be in focus on the back of that news flow. And well the lock-in period will also be ending for IRFC, Blue Jet Health on the 29th, Cello World as well as Hunasa consumer on the 31st. Remember, these are newly listed companies, new kids on the block, relatively new kids. So, well, um, all these events, keep your eye out for all of them as well. Absolutely. Let's take a look at some other news coming in from China then. After the recent sell-off in Chinese equities, country securities regulator said it will be suspending lending of restricted shares starting today. This comes amid efforts to put the Chinese stock markets back on their foot. Remember, a string of of supportive policies by Beijing, including a deep cut to bank reserves, helped lift Chinese stocks off five-year lows early last week, but they retreated again last week. And well, keeping it with China, then a second straight yearly decline for industrial profits in 2023. Now, profits at industrial firms have declined 2.3% due to sluggish demand, adding pressure on economic growth amid a deep property slump and deflationary risks. The drop followed a 4.4% profit fall in the first 11 months from the same period a year earlier. And news flow from China doesn't end here. Beijing has reportedly sent dozens of military aircraft and Ships towards Taiwan, important to note that the missiles were sent on the same day of a low-profile meeting between China and the US. What's left to see is what current conditions lead to given China's approach to Taiwan, which it considers its territory is a sensitive sticking point in its precarious relationship with the US, which believes in Taiwan keeping its self-governing status. Well, and leading U.S. carrier United Airlines has reportedly approached Airbus for a purchase of A321 Neo jets to fill a potential void left by the delayed Boeing 737 MAX 10 in a trade-off likely to ease deadlock over a long-delayed separate order for larger jets. And at the annual meeting at Davos, a World Economic Forum report has thrown many questions on how businesses can be conducted. So can there be a common platform between business and faith? Uncle Mishra brings this interesting report. Take a look. Can business and religion go hand in hand? Many would think there may not be much connection between the two. But a recently released World Economic Forum report, Faith in Action, indicates a deep intersection between business and faith. The report, through eight case studies, offers examples of business partnering with faith-based groups to support vulnerable populations and address world's interconnected crisis. Interestingly, ISKCON and Haripal Company featured among the top four cases. In our research, we came across the work of Haribol and ISKCON and the work that they are doing to mitigate the effects of climate change by empowering rural communities in India and supplying a faith community with products that they desperately need but did not have access to. And so that's why we featured the Haribo case study, because it's such a lighthouse exemplary case study of what is possible when faith and business work together. 
Haribol is a Mumbai-based food and beverage company established in 2020. It has carved out a unique niche by selling its products to traditional Indian and Hindu groceries globally, contributing to rural development in India, mitigating greenhouse gas emission through their state-of-art technology. For faith organizations, it is not just about PNL. It is about the ethos and it is about protecting the core of doing something. So for us, as Haribol, the core is about serving society. So if I have to take a product and give it to a certain uh, sector of society, or not only just ISKCON, but to the wider audience, it's about, they should have this confidence that if it is coming from an organization, it, it is pure, it has its ethics and values at place. And that is what Haribol, uh, you know, the aim of Haribol is. Given 85% of world's population are religious adherents, the report has advocated that global leaders cannot afford to ignore the impact of religion and spirituality. In Mumbai, Vinny Motiwala with Ankur Mishra for Meetina. All right, with that, we'll slip into a very short break. When we return, we'll take stock of how the Asian markets are looking this morning, so stay tuned. Hi there, welcome back and thanks so much for staying tuned to Market Cafe. You're watching ET now. Let's take stock of how the Asian markets have opened up this morning and well, they look like they're largely in the green as we speak ahead of a slew of GDP and inflation numbers due out from various regions this week. Now, this week's major events will be China's factory activity figures for January as well as Australia's fourth quarter inflation figures on Wednesday. Now, this will be the last set of key data before the Reserve Bank of Australia's meeting on the 5th of Feb. So, in Australia, the ASX 200 traded close to the flatline on open, but it's building on to those gains, at three tenths of a percent uptake on uh, the Australian index as we speak. Shifting focus then on Wednesday, Taiwan and Hong Kong will also release their fourth quarter GDP numbers. On the back of that, let's see what Hang Seng is doing. Hang Seng is up a solid 1.5%, that index holding on strong. Shifting focus, let's also see what Shanghai is doing. Shanghai is slightly in the red, 7 points in the red, not much over there. Let's see if that can flip sides and flip on to the green. Shifting focus to Japan, Japan's Nikkei rebounded from Friday's losses and rose half a percent on opening. It continues to build on to those gains, gains, 8 tenths of a percent uptick coming in on Japan also as we speak. And lastly, let's also see what Kospi is doing. Kospi also holding on in the green, up 1.1% as we speak. So strong gains coming in across indices. Shanghai only nominally in the red. Let's see if that can flip sides. Shifting focus back home, then Nifty on Thursday, we managed to close around the 21,350 whereabouts. Implied open at 21,652, so rather the solid start implied for us, a gap up opening is what is implied at 21,641. Six tenths of a percent higher is what the gift Nifty is implying, Shayan Singh. Hi there, welcome back. You're still watching Market Cafe on ET Now. Let's talk about a stock that's going to be in focus today and that's India Bulls Housing because that has announced its right issue to raise more than 3,600 crore rupees. Somit gets us an analysis of what it means and what should investors do in this case. Somit, good morning. Take it away. Well, if you see, India Bulls has finally announced its rights issue details. The amount that the company is looking to raise is close to 3,693 rupees. Now, the rights issue price is at around 150 rupees per share, which is at a discount of nearly 25% compared to the current market price of the uh, last uh, closing price of India Bulls housing that we have. Now, the ratio on which uh, the uh, rights issue will be given is that for every two shares of rights issue, uh, every two shares of uh, sh uh, sh shares that an investor has in India Bulls housing, Finance, they'll get one uh, rights issue share extra. Now, the record date uh, to be eligible for this rights issue is February 1st, which means that uh, any investor who wants to participate in this rights issue needs to have the uh, needs to buy these shares last by January 31st, 2024. Now, the rights issue opens on February 7th and will remain open uh, till Feb 13th, 2024. Now, if you see, uh, if eligible for rights issue, the rights entitlement would be credited to an uh, investor's shareholder by Feb 6th. Now, what's a rights entitlement? It's a temporary credit of shares and any investor could trade in this RE uh, till uh, 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 I, I can keep this RE or in fact sell this in the market. Now, if they want to uh, keep this RE, uh, if they want to sell this RE, they have the last date to sell this RE by Feb 8th 
and on application if you see an investor will need to pay around 50 rupees per share while the remaining 100 rupees uh, will need to be paid by an investor over the next 12 months at the time period given by the company now what options do existing investors have here now for any existing investor if they uh, sell the re they can consider the re value that they realize as a dividend because if you see the actual amount that they will realize by selling the 50 shares at a uh, estimated price of around 49 rupees that we are expecting for the re that is the best base price that we are expecting they would realize a value of close to 2450 crore rupees which translates into a dividend per share of nearly 24.5 rupees now the company has never paid such a high dividend in the past many years now if they keep re uh, that's the rights entitlement there's too much of has hassle they need to keep uh, uh, they need to track the date of payment for the rights issue also if they fail to pay this amount uh, the rights uh, shares will be forfeited so it's too much of a hassle for an existing investor so it would be more uh, viable for them to go ahead and sell the re and take uh, the dividend amount going forward now uh, if there were if there's a fresh investor they can also do an arbitrage here they can buy the uh, india bulls housing shares on jan 31st they will get the re shares they can sell the re shares in the market and at a base price of 49 rupees that we are expecting the minimum gain for an investor would be around 2.3 percent now if uh, the re list is a premium of around 40 percent then the gains could be around six odd percent over the next one week for any investor now if they want to be a long term investor in india bulls housing uh, they can might they might as well keep the actual uh, shares of uh, actual 100 shares of india bulls housing plus the 50 re shares that they will get now the normal cost of buying around 150 shares from market at this point would be around 29850 while if they buy the 100 shares and keep the 50 re shares the normal holding cost would be around 22400 the balance amount they can keep in any uh, sweep in fd or sbi fd which would fetch them around 5.75% return so these are the uh, potential options for the existing and the new investors of india bulls housing at this moment Absolutely. Thanks, Omid, for that roundup. India Bulls Housing, keep that on your radar. But capital markets regulator SEBI has released a circular to extend the timeline for top companies to verify market rumors. Now, the listed entities were divided into two broad categories, that is top 100 and top 250 by market capitalization. My colleague Ankur Mishra has more details. Ankur, what exactly does the circular say and what are the deadlines that top corporates should mark on their calendars as well? Yes, market regulator SEBI has given breather to top listed firms as the deadline for implementation of market rumor verification norms has been extended. Earlier, these norms uh, were supposed to be applied from February 1st, 2024, at least for top 100 listed firms. Now, this deadline has been extended till June 2024. Similarly, uh, for top 250 firms, uh, the deadline was uh, August 2024 and that deadline has now been shifted to December 2024. Now it is a kind of breather because in the second time in a row market regulator has extended the deadline. Apart from that industry standard forum has also been uh, set An important thing to note here is that as far as the proposal is concerned uh, uh, it was proposed that uh, as per materiality of the events uh, this uh, market rumor verification needs to be done but uh, now industry standard forum has suggested that it should be based on the price movement of scripts uh, not just uh, materiality of the events now all in all we need to say uh, what actually is the implementation of these norms uh, because that will be done in consideration with industry standard forum well, all right, Uncle, thanks for all of those details. That's your focus then. And another boost to India's aviation sector, France's Airbus has inked a deal with the Tata Group to make civilian helicopters in the country, making it India's first helicopter assembly facility in the private sector. My colleague Sumit is joining in with more details. Sumit, what are you picking up? Well, it's a deal of its own kind, first kind in India, where Tata Group of India and Airbus of France, they have joined an agreement. They've signed an agreement, in fact, to a manufacturer this uh, H125 helicopter, civilian helicopter, and for that uh, FAL, which is full assembly line, will be set up. Uh, this will come up in two years, and uh, India and uh, Tata Group and Airbus plan to export these to neighboring countries as well. It's a deal of its own kind because currently uh, there's no uh, civilian, uh, this kind of manufacturing happening of helicopters in India. But remember Tata and Airbus both already uh, are making C295 transport aircraft already in PM Modi's uh, state of Gujarat in Vadodara and taking this partnership further. Now they will manufacture these helicopters as well. Uh, remember, uh, 
Macron's visit, uh, President Macron's visit is coming at a time India and France are coming closer in ties. They have 25 year plan to extend cooperation in many fields and manufacturing of this kind will be helpful for the Tata Group and Airbus in India. We talk about Tata Group. As a, as a individually, it's it has good emissions in uh, aviation space in India. It manufactures uh, plane uh, helicopters now, and it also owns Air India and Vistara Air Asia India also. So clearly, a big boost for India's partnership of Tata Group or to Airbus of France. Well, thanks so much for that roundup. But let's keep it with the aviation space now. Domestic carrier SpiceJet has raised 744 crores in the first tranche of its capital infusion. So tell us a little bit more about this particular news as well, Sumit. Well, it's clearly a boost to spice it now. And coming at a time, it was going through tough phase. But on December 12th of last year, it announced that the board has given uh, OK to raise 2200 crore rupees. Though this first tranche of 744 crore rupees is part of that only. Spice it, as we all know, that was going through a tough time. But fund was fund infusion was needed and this will go a long way in ensuring good financial health for the airline uh, to, uh spicejet plan to use this one this fund for expansion both in domestic and overseas markets and that's why it's an important fund if you, in infusion so going forward many more infusion of this in different tranches will happen but this was crucial and it has happened already as announced by spicejet all right, Sumit, thanks for all of those details. With that, we'll slip into a very short break on this edition of Market Cafe. We'll be back with more stock-specific news on the other side, so you stay tuned. Welcome back. Thank you so much for staying tuned in and while coming back from a truncated week, important to also understand how the futures and options space is shaping up as well. We have Ansh right here in the studio to help us understand that better. Ansh, what are you looking at? Right, so starting with Nifty first, uh, let's get the chart on the screen as well. Uh, as you can see in the chart, Nifty closed just below that consolidation range of 21,500 to 21,800, indicating still a bit bearish stance over there. Whereas in index options, we are seeing call writing happening at 21,400, uh, followed by 21,500, indicating traders expecting Nifty to take resistance around this level. Uh, whereas on downside, we are seeing mild put buying happening at 21,300. So option traders are expecting Nifty to maybe close below this level uh, in today's or in one or two sessions. Let's have a quick view on Nifty Bank as well. As you can see in the chart, Nifty Bank has been hovering between that 100 DMA and 200 DMA for two sessions. So if it gives a breakout on upside from 100 DMA, we can see another resistance at 46,500. But if we give, uh, if we slip below that 200 DMA, we can find a good support at 43,400 level. Let's also see what FIS did. Now this is something which we haven't been mentioning from a quite few sessions because there was no uh, substantial change in FIS but in previous session we saw biggest single session long covering in at least three years. So in index futures we saw them uh, covering around 88,000 long contracts, they added 12,000 short contracts so net to net we are seeing a net reduction of 1 lakh contracts. Due to it their total long has slipped from 48.4% down to 22%. So this shows their bearish stance in the market. Well, absolutely, on. So we'll see how that pans out for us because we have a different picture on the GIF Nifty. So, well, we'll see how that pans out for us, where levels go today. But uh, amid a market like this, what are the stocks that we should be watching out for as well? Right. So, EU Small Finance will be the first stock in focus for today's trading session. As company has reported, interest income, uh, which is up by 29% on year-on-year -year basis, to 2,736 crore, whereas the PAT has uh, is down by around 4.5% from 393 crore to 375 crore. Also, the provisions they have reported is up by 39% on quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Apart from this, Chola Mandalam will also be in focus as uh, they have reported net interest income, which is up by around 35-36% to 2,171 crore, whereas the PAT has jumped by 28% and provisions has uh, actually come down by 10% to 358 or 359 crore. Uh, apart from this, intellect design will also be in focus as they have reported revenue which is up by 16%, net profit is up by 36%. Whereas for IFB Industries, we are seeing revenue going up by around 16% and net profit, uh, they have reported net profit of 17 crore as compared to the loss in the previous year. Lastly, Sriram Finance will be in focus as they have reported net interest income which is up by around 17% to 4,911 crore, whereas their profit is up mildly by 2.3% to 1,818 crore. 
So keep an eye on the stocks. Absolutely, Ansh. So we'll keep an eye on all of those counters. But another counter that will be in focus will be ITC as well. ITC will be reporting its third quarter numbers and a slight uptick in revenue as well as profit is being penciled in. What else is the street penciling in? Winnie has the answer. Winnie. So absolutely, in terms of numbers that we are expecting from ITC this time around, revenue is expected to see a muted growth of around 2 to 3 percent is what we could say. Nothing exciting in terms of numbers that is expected from ITC. In terms of margins, a contraction in terms of margins because of the raw material pricing, that is still impacting the margins of the company. So EBITDA margin expected at 37.7 percent versus 38.4 percent last year. Cigarette volume growth, a key number that we watch out for, expected to come in at 2 percent. Let's not forget the higher base that was there also in the last year as well. And then that, Hotels business is expected to see a good growth this time as well. Festive season, wedding season, all that does support the hotel business growth. Agri business, paper business continuing to see a bit of a pressure this time around as well. And we are expecting that pressure uh, to be building on in this quarter for this, both these businesses around a 7-8% uh, uh, slip in terms of the sales of both these segments. FMCG business, so that's the one we're keeping an eye out on. High single digit growth is expected. Food category is expected to fare better than the BPC category. Cigarette a bit margin, that's the one uh, maybe that is expected to remain a bit flattish as well. So in terms of key commentaries, we're watching out for the cigarette volume growth, demand trend outlook that is there coming in overall for the business, hotel business growth and, you know, the, where the process is reaching in terms of the demerger, as well as outlook for FMCG, agri, paper, segment-wise outlook, key factors to watch out for. Well, absolutely, Winnie. Thanks for taking us through that. Now, along with ITC, you've also got Bajaj Finance that will be reporting its quarter three earnings today. So what is the street penciling in? Vamakshi is here with all the expectations. Vamakshi, a strong quarter three expected on the back of a festive season quarter? Well, a strong steady quarter is what we're expecting from Bajaj Finance this time around. And roughly the growth is expected to be in line with the kind of growth that the company has been posting over the last couple of quarters. In fact, it is also important to take note of the Q3 provisional update. AUM saw growth of almost 34.7% uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. And in fact, this is the highest AUM growth that the company has seen in the last 16 quarters. Backed by a strong AUM growth, we're also expecting to see some strong growth flow through the company's financials as well. Let's also look at the NII, that is the net interest income expectations. NII is expected to come in at 7,530-odd crores, an uptick of almost 27% is what we're penciling in out here. PPOP is also expected to see an uptick of almost 27%. Net profit is also expected to grow by almost 26%. Provisions are expected to, however, come higher by almost 11% on a sequential basis. Largely, the expectation is uh, that the company could post strong earnings growth backed by the festive season. NIM contraction is also expected this time around. In fact, the company in its last com call had also guided that they were expecting 25 to 30 basis points of, de uh, of decline in the uh, net interest margin. And that was mainly on account of cost of uh, funds uh, increasing. Apart from that, the cost to income ratio is expected to be steady. Credit cost and asset quality are also expected to remain stable on a sequential basis. So largely, those were the expectations expectations from Bajaj Finance, but uh, we will be watching out for commentary that comes through, especially on the sustenance of growth momentum, the scale up of the new products. It is also important to monitor uh, how the company's unsecured loan growth is expected to pan out given uh, RBI's increased risk weight for this segment. Apart from that, we will also be keeping a close eye on the company's updates on the resumption of banned digital loan products. RBI's observations on its, on its credit card tie-up with RBI Bank will be another important uh, factor to watch out for and lastly we will also be watching out for the kind of asset quality that is evolving especially in the unsecured part of the book so largely those were all the expectations for Bajaj Finance this time around a good steady set is what we're expecting thanks for Akshi. so we'll definitely be keeping an eye on Bajaj Finance but on to some more news and updates now a liquor store has opened in Saudi Arabia for the first time in over 70 years. While restricted to non-Muslim diplomats, this comes as Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman aims to make the kingdom a tourism and business destination as part of his ambitious plan to slowly wean its economy away from crude oil. And in another U-turn, in a long list of U-turns, Bihar CM Nitish Kumar snaps ties with Grand Alliance yet again to switch allegiance to the BJP. Nitish took the oath as Bihar CM for the record ninth time. This was his fifth switch in political loyalty since 2015. 
Well, shifting focus then, Bini Bansal, the co-founder of Flipkart, has officially resigned from the board of the e-commerce giant. This comes after Walmart's acquisition of a controlling stake in Flipkart and Bini, who recently sold his remaining stake to Walmart, has now launched a new startup called Opdoor. He's also an active angel investor and board member of PhonePay. And let's just focus on the weather because Kashmir's mountains have received light snowfall and the plains witnessed light rainfall on Sunday, breaking the prolonged dry spell over the last two months as it turns Kashmir into a mesmerizing winter wonderland. Well, with this, it's curtains down on this edition of Market Cafe on ET Now with me, Shriyansi Singh, and my co-anchor Snehi Shah. It's a thank you from the team that put the show together as well. But stay tuned because the market takes the action forward.